All right, uh, time to film my book review. Hopefully nothing weird happens that causes me to have to do the review in an unusual location. Oh, thank the gods of the sea. I've found you. Well, so much for that. Come with me to Tiankawi. It's a floating city filled with humans and various types of water-dwelling races called Fathom Folk. The humans live up in high towers and literally look down on the submerged folk beneath them. What accent is that? I have no idea, but I need you to come with me. I... sure. Wait, you're... you're just coming along? It's... it's that easy? You're going to make me come no matter what. Let's just, let's just go. Well, uh, oh, alrighty then. Hey, I'm underwater. Yes, you can breathe here. I use my water weaving. No, that's not how it works in the book. Just roll with it. Water weaving? Well, that sounds like a cool magic system. Uh, what else can it do? We can control water to throw around and damage things. It's basically water bending from Avatar, but with less utility, and we get very little information on how it works. It's easy to forget it's even there until it becomes plot relevant. Oh, uh, well, at least all the different races of Fathom Folk are different and unique, right? Kind of. We've got sirens, kappa, water dragons, sea witches, even literal gods, and most of us have a human form we can transform into as well. Do you all have your own separate kingdoms and cultures? No, we have a bunch of underwater cities, but those are all very much a mashup of different races. There's not, say, a Kappa kingdom where they all live separate from the rest of us. So, so you don't have different cultures or anything? Our powers are a little bit different. Sirens can charm people with their voices, and Kappa don't have a human form. Uh, other than that, we share pretty much the exact same government and culture. So you're all the same? Not quite. We all have our own internal biases and politics. Uh, for example, water dragons are nobility. But other than that, uh, yeah, we're all uh, pretty much the same. The author just tries to assure everyone that we're different without actually showing how we're all different. Are you all equal? We are all equal in being oppressed by the humans of Tiankawi. So, yes. Okay, you've given me the setup for the world. Uh, what is the book Fathom Folk about exactly? Well, humanity has been polluting everything in the ocean with their floating cities, and so a bunch of us are forced to move into their cities for work. And then a young noble girl named Nami gets in trouble and is forced to come to Tian Kawi, and then she gets caught up in a conflict between the new arrivals and the people who already lived there. Why are the floating cities such a problem? Can't the humans just live, you know, on land? The land is all flooding. Many of the human residents of cities like Tiankawi are also refugees. But if the land is all flooding, then humanity has no choice but to live in their floating cities. Uh, correct. So isn't there some moral ambiguity to this situation? Isn't your home expanding the thing that caused humans to flee out to the oceans and then start polluting so much? Uh... No. Then how did it happen? I'm not sure. The world building here is... is pretty vague. Is any of the book told from a human perspective? Or are there any major human characters at all? Not really. They just exist as a formless entity that is evil! But evil in, like... A banal way. So it's a poorly thought out metaphor for racism? Of course. It's a little better than that sort of thing usually is though, because it acknowledges that racism comes forth in many different ways, and also that society is made up of individuals. Some people want to help, some people don't. So it's a very complex situation. Is there a big event that makes things worse, and then people who were on the fence finally decide to side with the folk? Nope. In fact, there's a reveal halfway through the book where we learn that the folk of the city used to be held in a walled-off section of the city that was basically a concentration camp, but that's been shut down, and now things are better, and they have a lot more rights and freedoms than they used to. So things are actually improving by the time the story starts? Yep! Doesn't that make the people who are demanding radical change seem like idiots who don't realize that things are on the upswing? Yep! 
And doesn't that remove a lot of dramatic tension from the story when we realize that the heroes could do nothing and things would be better? Yep. And doesn't that remove any sort of drama or commentary surrounding whether or not the characters decide to do things peacefully or violently? Uh, yep. Okay, so after Nami comes to the city, what happens then? Uh, a, a bunch of stuff. Such as? Well, there's a part of the book where Nami runs into some radical folk who want to use violence to achieve their goals and is put off by them. Certainly never seen that before. Look, a book doesn't need to be original to be good! It does need to be good, though. There's also a scene where Nami runs into some human girls who are wearing fishnets and have their makeup done up to look like folk and she's very annoyed with them. <laughs> that does sound pretty funny. And it sounds like it's difficult to summarize or explain the plot of Fathom Folk because it's a scattered mess that doesn't have much sense of forward momentum until near the end. Well... Yes. That's disappointing. And yet entirely expected. We've got other stuff. Like, there's a, there's a sea witch named Cordelia. Well, she sounds cool. Is she like a crime boss? Kind of. She has a lot of influence over the criminal underworld and the regular government, and she uses blackmail and harsh contracts to manipulate some of the characters. She has some really great moments, but she's not really the antagonist. Are any of the other characters any good? Not really, no. Nami is dull, and her sister-in-law is named Mira. She's a half-siren cop, actually the highest-ranking folk cop in the entire city of Tiankawi. Well, what's her deal? Other folks hate and distrust sirens because they can use magic to manipulate people, sort of. And she's, like, really insecure about that. All sirens are bastards, I guess. That's racist. Does the city of Tiankawi have any personality? I mean, the setting is often the best and most fleshed out part of books like this. A lot of amateur or just not very good authors straight up forget to write a story and just world build forever. Not really. You never get a sense for the city's layout, how big it is, or even how the human neighborhoods are really different from the folk neighborhoods. Nothing at all? Well, you know that the folk neighborhoods are partially underwater and also poor, but that's, that's about it. If the story is unfocused, does that also mean that the pacing is bad? Yeah. So is it bad because it's too fast or too slow? Uh, kind of both. Part of the problem might be that the book starts off the way a lot of fantasy books do, where it has a lot of separate chapters following different characters and different storylines that don't come together until later, but all of the chapters are really short, so by the time you're just starting to get invested into what's happening with one storyline, you get pulled away. Are all of the chapters too short? Most of them throughout the book, and it really throws the pacing out of whack. Would Fathom Folk have been better if it was longer and spent more time developing the setting? Probably. Would it be better if the author just wrote one more draft and gave a bit more description to the scenes so that they were more impactful? Yes. Would it be better if the characters had better defined personalities and felt less like surface-level interpretations of more complex characters? Certainly. Would it be better if the big moments such as the climax had more time dedicated to them and were written like the big important events that they're supposed to be? Yeah. Does that mean we've covered everything and I can go home? Not yet! I need to talk about what happens at the end! Oh, uh... Okay, well hurry up, I need to go meet my friends later. Christian, cut it out! So... Enlighten me, what happens at the end? So the radical, violent folk find out that Tiankawi was built on top of a sleeping god, so they go and kill it. Wait, what? Yeah, this feels really out of place in the book, too. Okay, how do they kill this literal god that just popped up? They stab it and put some poison in the wound. That seems a bit too easy for such a momentous event, don't you think? They're villains! Things are supposed to be easy for them, so it puts the heroes in a difficult spot. But if killing a god is really that simple, how come no one's done it before? What? You know, if killing a god is that easy, how come 
no evil or fanatical people have done it already. Uh, th th they never thought of it. Everyone in this world sounds like kind of an idiot. Well, after that, the death of the god causes a gigantic tsunami to come by and hit the city. Oh my goodness, it, is the climax an exciting sequence with everyone trying to survive this disaster? Sort of. That happens, but it's all over in just a few pages. Oh, that's... disappointing. Don't worry, the humans who were hit by the wave all start growing gills, so they're folk now. Doesn't this imply that all the folk are just mutated humans and have been all along? Yeah, isn't that a great twist? Not if you're doing the racism allegory. This implies that humans are the default and everyone else just has something wrong with them. The sequels will answer all of your questions in a satisfying manner. If you say so. That's a crazy ending though, right? Right? Well, kind of. It doesn't focus on the weird parts enough for them to leave much impact. In fact, it feels kind of like the author just laid out the ingredients for a weird, crazy, great climax, but then didn't mix them properly. Have you read anything like that in other mermaid books? Sort of. I actually read a different mermaid book recently called Of Poseidon. Don't worry, I'll cover that one day. It's... it's odd. So, you don't think Fathom Folk is very good? No, it's not. I would say that this book suffers from Lightlark Syndrome, where on paper everything sounds great, but the world building is nonsensical when you stop to think about it for even half a second, and that's a death sentence for any sort of fantasy story. What do you mean? I mean it's impossible to be invested in a conflict when the conflict doesn't add up. Everyone involved looks stupid, or just generally unaware of their surroundings. Hey, that, that guy's not wearing any pants. Is he allowed to do that? So you're saying that the muddled racism allegory is just a microcosm for how the whole book fails? Yes, I'm saying that. I am also saying that the general lack of depth for Tian Kawi and the world at large does a huge disservice to this book. But it's exciting! Storytelling is about the big picture, not the little details! That's the other major problem. Everything is told in the most boring way possible. Scenes and character descriptions, like, they, they're just bland and they don't give us enough information to really care about what's going on or for the book to develop any sort of real atmosphere. Does Fathom Folk do anything right? Sure, it has a few good ideas and a couple of moments pulled me in. I, I did really like Cordelia the Sea Witch. I mean, I liked how she knew that just because she's a sea witch, everyone was going to hate her no matter how she acted, so she just leaned into that and acted however she felt like. You know, that's, that's not something I've seen in villains very often. Anything else? The cover is pretty cool. And the strained relationship between Mira and her husband? That felt forced, to be honest. What about the epic battle between good and evil? Well, I'd like one if it was here, but it's not. Well, f thanks for coming down here. I appreciate hearing your thoughts. Can you send me back home now? This is your home, silly. You're going to grow gills and become like the rest of us, remember? I don't think that's how that works. It works however the author says it works! Now, uh, you can come home with me. You can meet my sister. She hasn't been able to find a mate to fertilize her eggs yet. If I jump in that trench over there, do you think the water pressure at the bottom will be enough to kill me? Probably, yes. Uh, why? Take a wild guess. Hello there, friends, and people who aren't friends but watched this far for whatever reason. Uh, thank you. Uh, all these names you see on screen here, these are my $5 and up patrons, and a special, special thanks to my $10 and up patrons, who are Arthur D. Gonzalez Martin, Brother Santodes, Carolina Clay, Ich bin Langweilig, Kiana Arms, Lexi Delorme, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Michael and Katie Hake, Mr. A5013, Pros Proscriptions of Zhuo Jang, Rovi, Psych XS, Slumbering Jello Jellyfish, Observing Outer Space, Tesla Shark, Toa Michael, Bay Victus, and Wesley. Thanks to all of them. Without them, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do this. If you want to get your name here, then consider donating on my Patreon page or becoming a YouTube channel member. You can get early access to videos as well as some other exclusive videos every month. 
If that sounds like fun, then go ahead. If you don't feel like doing that, you know, rate the video, comment, subscribe. That also works. I appreciate you no matter what. Uh, thanks for watching. Goodbye.